Welcome to Mind, Muscle, and Metabolism, the Jade Tita Podcast. Here you get the in-depth science and practical tools needed to change your body, optimize your health, and elevate your mindset. I'm Dr. Jade Tita, and here is what I want you to know. You are different. You are as unique on the inside chemically as you are on the outside physically. And those differences matter. They matter because there is only one rule to achieving optimal health, fitness, and body change. That rule, do what works for you. My goal is to help you understand exactly how. I'm so excited you're here. Your transformation starts right now. Welcome to the podcast, everybody. I know it's been kind of a long hiatus for me. I've been um, traveling around and just moved to my fall location. I usually spend summer and winter in Santa Monica, California, and fall and spring in Asheville, North Carolina. So I'm in Asheville, North Carolina now. And, you know, when I first decided to do this podcast, I thought I'd do you know, several different episodes and then give myself a break just because I'm doing other things and uh, then I would bring it back. And so I'm going to do probably a series of anywhere from 10 to 15 uh, podcast episodes and then take another break probably around January. And we'll see how that goes with, uh, you know, some of the things I've been up to. But uh, one of the things I wanted to do is just jump into a pretty complex topic and one that you may or may not have heard about. And I think it's a good place to um, start with the upcoming episodes, and that is the concept of metabolic flexibility. And this is a pretty tough concept uh, to grasp. And so there's a lot uh, that goes on in here, and I'll try to make it as simple as I can. I actually just did an article for Testosterone Nation. I don't know how many of you guys and girls listen to or uh, frequent Testosterone Nation, but I write for them, and they're just really, really good. I really enjoy that. And I did a whole thing on metabolic flexibility, and it, I think that article ended up being about 5,000 words. It was a really long article, so we'll see how much of it they publish. But one of the ways I started out that article to help people understand what exactly metabolic flexibility is, is I went through this sort of uh, thing of when I left Santa Monica, I was <laughs> literally in the car trying to get out of town to drive across country. And I'm stuck in traffic. And it's annoying the hell out of me. You know, my back is hurting. I had done squats the day before, so I'm in the car. I'm squirming around. I'm in stop-and-go traffic, and everything is absolutely congested. And next thing you know, now I feel like I have to pee, and I'm just like, I'm going to have to pull over, stretch out my back. I'm going to have to go to the bathroom. This is ridiculous. I'm never getting out of L.A. It's going to take two hours, and L.A. is pretty notorious for that, by the way. I mean, just congested traffic. So I went on my phone, on my Waze app, and looked for an alternative route, found it, got around the traffic a little bit. In about 45 minutes, I was on my way outside of Los Angeles proper. And at that point, the highway started to open up. And all of a sudden, my back feels better. And all of a sudden, I don't have to pee anymore, right? So all those things were kind of stress-related, sort of this locked-up type of feeling. So this is kind of how your metabolism functions when it is overloaded with primarily starch, sugar, and fat, and alcohol as well. And we can kind of think of this as metabolic gridlock. So I want you to keep this in mind as we begin to talk about metabolic flexibility, this analogy of traffic, right? And in this analogy, we kind of have lots of different fuels we can burn, right? We have sugar, which if you measure that on a blood test, it's blood glucose. So your fasting glucose is the amount of sugar you have in your blood. If you have a lot of it, that probably means you're not burning sugar well. Triglycerides is the form that your fat travels in. So it's a glycerol molecule with three fatty acids. And fatty acid is just another biochemical way of saying that long chain of fat. So when you see blood triglycerides on a blood lab, that is your fat that's floating around in your blood. And if that's high, you're probably not burning fat well. So you can burn sugar and you can burn fat. And these are the primary fuels we burn. You can also burn protein, but typically when you burn protein, it's going to follow lots of different pathways. Protein can be broken down into and made into glucose. Protein can also be broken down and made into 
uh, ketones. And so that's why we have these uh, ketogenic amino acids and gluconeogenic amino acids. They can be sort of broken down to make other products that can then be burned. And they can certainly find their way into multiple different pathways in our uh, sort of energy be producing um, reactions in our body. Now, of course, we can burn alcohol too. Alcohol has, you know, seven calories per gram and alcohol breaks down to the same sort of uh, component that fats and sugars do, a compound called acetyl-CoA. And then we can burn ketones as well, but if you're going to be able to make ketones, you have to be able to break down fat a little bit because ketones are made from fat and ketogenic amino acids. And so we have lots of different fuels that we can use. And metabolic flexibility essentially refers to the ability of our body to choose the different fuels it wants to burn based on energy demands and environmental conditions and to be able to switch back and forth. And so, you know, a lot of times people think about, oh, I want a fast metabolism. You really don't want a fast metabolism. You don't want Usain Bolt as your metabolism unless he can juggle flaming swords and jump over, jump through hoops and, you know, uh, do the hurdles as well. In other words, you want a flexible metabolism, an adaptive metabolism, not a fast metabolism. Usually when you try to speed up the metabolism, you're almost always speeding up hunger and cravings as well. And this is why uh, cold water therapies and things like that, we thought that those would be very helpful to burn fat. The only problem is they usually end up speeding up calorie intake as well. And so you more than make up for any benefit uh, that you have. This is why exercise actually, which speeds up metabolism, is uh, difficult for most people to get results from that because it also speeds up, quote, hunger. And so what you really want is a flexible metabolism. Now, if we go back to this uh, highway analogy, you can kind of think of uh, alcohol as sort of these big rig, you know, 18-wheeler trucks, right? They get, it gets in the way. And you can kind of think of uh, fat as sort of just the regular car, cars or sedans. And you can kind of think of sugar as, you know, SUVs and things like that. You know, you might say, well, Jade, in this analogy, then what's protein and ketones? Well, protein, because it's uh, a pretty flexible fuel, meaning it has multiple entry points into energy uh, metabolism, it is also, though, a very costly fuel. Our body really doesn't want to give it up. It comes with a penalty. You know, obviously we'd rather keep it for locomotion and store it as muscle. And so in this analogy, probably the best way to think of protein is as, you know, bicycles or motorcycles or an Uber or those, you know, sort of electric birds that are showing up in all the cities, those electric scooters. They're very flexible. They let you get around and weave in and out of traffic. But if it starts raining or something like that, they're kind of a pain in the ass. They take a little bit of more work um, to deal with, right, and have a cost associated with them. And, you know, ketones in this analogy are probably public transport, right? You know, so buses and uh, trains and subways and things like that. And so when you can switch into ketosis and you're burning that, it can free up the highways a little bit. And the reason I bring all this up about the highways is because there's some very complicated biochemistry that goes on when we think about metabolic flexibility, but I'm hoping this analogy of traffic and cars will help make it more simple for you. So here's the thing to remember. When sugar and fat, the two primary fuels that we burn in our body, are broken down and before they can get into the inner mitochondria, which are these energy producing factories inside our cells that actually do the energetic work to pump out energy for our body, they have to be each be broken down into a compound called acetyl-CoA. And so this is this converging point where glucose, sugar, gets burned down into acetyl-CoA, and fat also gets burned down into acetyl-CoA. Now, glucose is slightly different. If you're an astute biochemist, you know glucose can also be made into a compound called oxaloacetate. So when you think about it, glucose is broken down into acetyl-CoA, and fat is broken down into acetyl-CoA. And this acetyl-CoA molecule, once you get to that point, it blocks the other pathways. So for example, if you're burning nothing but sugar all the time, it will 
create several different compounds that block some of the fat burning enzymes that your body needs. In other words, if you're eating a particular fuel, you were exercise that particular metabolic pathway and become efficient at managing that pathway while blocking the other and vice versa. If you're eating a ton of fat, oftentimes the enzymes or byproducts, metabolic byproducts of burning fat will impede or block some of the sugar burning uh, pathways as a result. And this is one of the ways that the, one of the reasons I always say that the metabolism does not like to multitask. It can do it. It's just not very good at it. And so if you can think about this sort of converging pathway, burning sugar, burning fat, coming down to a subtle coA and sort of on your highways, having all of these cars around, especially if you eat something like a big pizza or, you know, some pasta with, you know, um, cheese and lots of fat or something like that, you're going to get your body being flooded with lots of glucose and lots of triglycerides. And the body oftentimes is not going to be able to burn each of those efficiently because each of them block the other's reaction. Alcohol is in particularly notorious for this because alcohol gets to acetyl-CoA a little bit faster than either sugar or fat will. And so if you eat a lot of alcohol or drink a lot of alcohol, it's not that it is being burned like sugar or blocking things in that regard. It's because this acetyl-CoA is slowing down. The body sees all this acetyl-CoA coming from alcohol and says, I don't need to burn sugar and I don't need to burn fat. And so this is partly what you want to be thinking about. And so one of the things that people miss with metabolic flexibility is this idea that sometimes it is beneficial to, quote, exercise one biochemical pathway rather than, you know, uh, sort of run both of them together. And this is why oftentimes diabetics who lose the ability to burn both fat and sugar, but mostly sugar, and that's the damaging uh, effects here, we oftentimes move them to a fat-based diet, a ketogenic diet. This is why Dr. Atkins, you know, many people may or may not know, but Dr. Atkins was uh, one of the first sort of medical proponents of a ketogenic diet, the Atkins diet. And he came up with that diet because he was working with morbidly obese diabetic patients in his clinic. And what he found out is that if he took away all the sugar and just ran this fat burning pathway, it gave the sugar burning pathways a break. Insulin resistance was uh, alleviated to some degree and he, can, he could reverse diabetes and help with uh, you know, obesity as well. And he also found that, you know, too much protein, because protein is sort of this go-between, right? You can burn it like sugar, or you can kind of burn it like fat and ketones. He also found that at times he'd have to uh, alleviate or eliminate some protein as well. And so this was one of the first ketogenic diets. And one of the benefits was is that it took away one of the pathways that the body was using exclusively and put all of its resources to another pathway for the body to use exclusively. And so this would be analogous to essentially saying, let's take all the SUVs off the road for a day. Let's take all the sugar out of the diet, or let's take all the alcohol, all the big rig 16 wheelers out of the diet. And all of a sudden, the highways run much more smoothly now, don't they? All of a sudden, things are not so congested and you can put distance between yourself and other cars. And this is partly what is going on and part of the benefit and part of what we want to begin to do when we're looking at metabolic flexibility. Let me tell you why this is important too, because there are essentially four steps that need to happen. And a lot of people misunderstand this, so we should really go through this. There's four steps that need to happen in regards to burning fuel. Let's use fat as the example. If you want to burn fat first, you have to release that fat from the fat storage depots, from the fat tissue. And so that is called lipolysis, lipid lysis, lipid breaking. That's when the fat gets out of the fat cell and into the bloodstream. But that's not fat burning. Now that fat, so that's step one, lipolysis, right? Step two is now that fat has to travel to the cells that are going to try to burn it. Let's say the muscle cell. 
Now that fat has to get inside the muscle cell. That's step three, and it needs insulin and other things to do that. And then the final step, step four, is lipid oxidation or fat burning. And so when we think about losing fat, we have to think about the fact that just because we release fat, lipolysis, does not mean that that fat ultimately gets into lipid oxidation, gets through the bloodstream, into the cell, and burn in the mitochondria. Oftentimes, people who are metabolically inflexible and have this metabolic gridlock and have all this sugar and all this fat hanging out in their blood, oftentimes that fuel doesn't get burned. And so it hangs out in the bloodstream and or it just gets restored. And this is why someone who's very metabolically inflexible, having severe insulin resistance, um, ends up in a position that even when they exercise, they might release some fat, but they don't burn it efficiently. And so what metabolic flexibility is and restoring metabolic flexibility is, is it's really teaching your body to burn all of its different fuels, to burn sugar and to burn fat and to burn protein when necessary and to create ketones when required and even to handle a little bit of alcohol. But what happens is when you overload the body with constant calories, a ton of fat, a ton of glucose and all this kind of stuff, you reach metabolic gridlock on your metabolic highway, so to speak. And so metabolic flexibility is really about fixing that. Now, you heard me mention insulin resistance, and it is a key component of metabolic flexibility. To have a flexible metabolism, one of the things you want is you want a very sensitive insulin receptor so that insulin, the hormone insulin, can bind to these receptors and then fuel can get inside the cell. One of the things that insulin does is it helps get glucose, amino acids from protein, and fat into cells so these things can be burned. So if that doesn't happen, the fat just floats around. And so here's the thing that you need to understand about the insulin component of metabolic flexibility. Many people are familiar with what I call the top-down model of insulin resistance, which essentially says eat a lot of carbohydrates primarily because that's the main influence on insulin and or protein, because protein is very insulinogenic, certain amino acids, and in certain people, protein can cause as much of an insulin spike as carbohydrate does. But when you're eating lots of carbs, and for some people, protein too, insulin levels get very, very high. And if you're doing that all of the time, insulin levels stay high. Now, in the body, we have what we call hormone resistance, which is very much like walking into a room with a strong smell. When you first get into the room, you might cover your nose, your eyes might water, you may be acutely aware of that smell. But over time, what happens? The receptors in your nose downregulate, right? The smell receptors downregulate, and all of a sudden, you don't smell that smell anymore. That's a, a form of resistance. So imagine if insulin is around knocking on the cellular doors constantly, screaming and yelling, being like, let me in, let me in. Eventually, the cells begin to uh, ignore it to some degree. And that means that now insulin can't cause glucose receptors to be expressed on the cell, and fat and protein can't get into the cell either. That's the top-down approach. Now, whether or not you call it carbohydrate or protein, or you just take a calorie approach, eating too much of pretty much anything, especially protein, or I'm sorry, especially carbohydrates, simple carbohydrates, especially without fiber and things like that, can cause a top-down insulin resistance. And by top-down, I mean food that you take in that then causes insulin resistance at the level of the cell. However, and this is the part about metabolic flexibility a lot of people don't understand, there's also a bottom-up mechanism that we are starting to understand. At the level of the mitochondria, if a ton of carbons start coming into the mitochondria, if a lot of acetyl-CoA, this molecule, starts coming into the mitochondria, the mitochondria get overloaded. This is very much like your favorite donut shop, right? You go, you have this donut shop and everyone wants to get in there all at once. And then the donut shop is overwhelmed and starts running out of donuts and cannot keep up with demand. This is very much what can happen to the mitochondria. Now, when that happens, right? Imagine in this donut shop, the, the, 
people start getting, the workers start getting aggravated, and now one of them, you know, gets so upset, he, like, you know, trashes the donut machine and does damage or is, you know, stealing money from the till or something like that, making the business run far less smoothly. This is what can happen in the mitochondria. It, the biochemical mechanism of this is the bio mitochondria start burning and creating a lot of smoke in the form of hydrogen peroxide. That can do damage inside the cell, causing the cellular machinery not to work as well, and so that when the cell makes an insulin receptor, that insulin receptor can be somewhat defective, or there's less insulin receptors produced. And so this would be the bottom-up you know, sort of uh, approach to insulin resistance. So yes, you can eat your food and then have that have this top-down effect, or you can eat your food and have this overwhelmed mitochondria effect and have that cause the insulin resistance. You also can have sort of a sideways effect, whereas stress and cortisol can cause insulin resistance as well. And insulin resistance is a hallmark of metabolic inflexibility. Some of you may have heard uh, the term that a lot of people use called the metabolic syndrome. Well, the metabolic syndrome is really sort of this syndrome of high blood triglycerides, high blood sugar, low HDLs, high blood pressure. It's sort of this syndrome that is a hallmark of metabolic inflexibility. And we don't always know where this is coming from. For some people, it's coming from the top-down effect. For some people, it's coming from the bottom-up effect. From other people, it's coming from the sideways effect. And for a lot of people, it's coming from all three. So the idea here is just to understand that on your metabolic highways, if you create this metabolic overwhelm, right, whether it's coming from the level of the mitochondria or it's coming from the level of the digestion and, and too much food that way or whether it's coming from stress, what we need to do is we need to understand what's going on with metabolic flexibility and realize that our metabolisms are not good multitaskers. And once we start losing the ability to burn one fuel, it's a pretty good idea to start exercising the other pathways and give that up that pathway that's compromised a break. This is analogous to Dr. Atkins taking all these diabetics who were devoted to the sugar burning pathway and giving them nothing but fat so they can burn the fat and give their sugar burning pathways a little bit of a break. And this is one of the key advantages and one of the two tools to, that can restore metabolic flexibility in people. One being the ketogenic diet, which is very, very good to help restore metabolic flexibility in a lot of people and intermittent fasting. Intermittent fasting and, and uh, uh, the keto diet probably do this from a top-down effect. Basically, in the one case, intermittent fasting, reducing calories, uh, and then in the other effect, reducing sugar. And both can have an effect. Reducing calories takes all the cars off the road, but reducing sugar primarily takes the SUVs and the big rig 16-wheelers off the road and makes our metabolic highways function much better. However, what happens if you have somebody who is dealing with dysfunctional mitochondria and then you start adding a bunch of fat into the mix, right? This is probably what happens, by the way, when you hear about keto flu and people trying to go from a sugar-based, carbohydrate-based diet to a keto-based diet, and they oftentimes don't feel well. And for a couple days to a couple weeks, many people can't make that transition. It's partly because they may be dealing with both a top-down and a bottom-up insulin resistance effect, or maybe even a sideways stress response effect. Think about it. If you eat a ton of fat all of a sudden and your mitochondria are compromised, what's going to produce more acetyl-CoA? Fat burning or sugar burning? Well, any biochemist among you should know that more acetyl-CoA is going to be produced by the fat burning. And this is why switching to you know, a high-fat diet very quickly for some people who have severe metabolic flexibility issues can be uh, somewhat of an issue there. And this is where you can move, instead of going from this carbohydrate-rich diet right into keto, a keto diet, this is where I basically come up with four different approaches for food that I think are better to restore metabolic flexibility. Approach one for someone who's very metabolically inflexible is to give them 
a little bit of sugar, but begin to decrease that sugar. And the way you do that is instead of going right to a bunch of fat, what you do is you can essentially go more towards fiber-based foods and protein. Remember, protein is a really good thing to help with hunger. Because remember, one of the things is the hallmark of metabolic inflexibility is hunger issues, energy issues, and craving issues, which make it almost impossible for many of these people to do an intermittent fasting approach or a keto approach. So in my mind, the first step for someone who's severely metabolically inflexible is to move them to two to two approaches. One, a higher fiber, higher protein diet, and two, eating very frequently to control that hunger. Now, is that ideal? No, that's not ideal. If we were all hunter-gatherers and couldn't get the food, even if we were starving, then we could just go cold turkey. But we live in a world where Cheesecake Factory and Starbucks are on every corner. And so many of these people that we try to bring into intermittent fasting and keto diets, we end up doing them harm because they simply can't stay on it. And we cause this binging type behavior where they're fasting for a bit and then they binge like crazy. And then that is the worst of all approaches. And so what we're essentially doing Doing when we're going small frequent meals with protein and fiber is we're essentially saying rather than having everyone go to work at rush hour and then come home from work at the same time, we're saying let's space out our traffic and some people will go to work at 6 a.m., other people will go to work at 8 a.m., some people go to work at 12 and they'll all come home at different times too. And so instead of having these traffic jams, we can smooth out traffic a little bit. That would be in my mind the beginning step for the very metabolically inflexible type of person. Then once we do that, then we can begin moving into more of an intermittent fasting approach. Now we can essentially say, all right, now that you're a little bit more stable and you've learned to control hunger and cravings, now let's basically take that same eating pattern where you're eating six meals per day, but let's make now instead of eating them from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., let's eat those meals from 12 p.m. to 8 p.m. And so we can shrink that window of eating time and that gives us much more time without any food at all to repair the met metabolism to repair the mitochondria to give the metabolism a little bit of a break so that to me would be step two first small frequent meals with protein and fiber next going into intermittent fasting type approach then going into sort of a keto diet type approach where you're like okay now that you can handle fat burning and you're a little bit more metabolically flexible, let's, let's take all of the sugar out of the diet and give you a moderate protein diet and feed you on fat so you can learn to burn fat again and you can really benefit from what the keto diet does. Those are three different approaches. And to me, the final approach and the most important approach is once you've restored metabolic flexibility, then you can spend time in all of these approaches, what I call the cyclical approach. So maybe... When winter comes around, you spend some time in what I call the eat less, exercise less approach. Maybe you do a keto-based diet in the winter and pair that with, you know, a few weight training sessions a week and mostly, you know, sort of walking around and that kind of stuff and adapting to the cold and exercising your metabolism that way. And then maybe when spring comes around, maybe for a time you do the eat less sort of exercise more approach, ELEM, lots of frequent meals full, filled with protein and fiber weight training and that kind of stuff, kind of a bodybuilding approach, right? And then maybe in the summer, you move to more of an eat more, exercise more approach where it's like an athlete type approach, higher carbohydrates, lower type fats, lots of that kind of stuff, good quality protein, and then switch it again. Or you can do it any way you want. Maybe it's eight weeks in keto and then four weeks in something else. The point though is, is that the metabolism is adaptive and reactive. It likes to be flexible. And you can help it along by understanding what you're doing, what metabolic flexibility is, how to restore metabolic flexibility, and to use these approaches smartly. And why sometimes going from a metabolically inflexible approach all the way to a keto diet can cause some issues somewhat. So 
I'm probably going to stop right there, but I think the cycling approach for most people who are metabolically flexible is an approach that works really, really well for people. One of the easiest ways to do this, and many people do it intuitively, is simply on the days you train hard, those are the days you might eat a little bit more, more frequent eating, maybe a little bit more carbohydrates. And on the days you don't train that much, these are the days where you can intermittent fast or have one meal or focus mostly on fats and those kinds of things. There's many different ways to do this. I often talk with women, and I think it's episode two of this podcast that talks about cycling these these approaches with the menstrual cycle because women are a little bit more metabolically flexible in the two weeks uh, that start their menstrual cycle versus the two weeks that end their menstrual cycle. And that also, that approach can also work. I'll mention a couple things here just because um, a lot of times people might say, well, I get how to deal with the top-down insulin resistance. I can just cut out carbohydrates, reduce my protein a little bit, you know, that kind of stuff. Start with small, frequent eating if I'm very obese and very metabolically inflexible. Maybe use fasting and that kind of stuff. And notice I'm focusing mainly on the nutrition things here because, remember, if you're not metabolically flexible and you start to exercise, you're going to feel pretty shitty because your body can't get the energy you want, and you're not going to burn a whole lot of fat because you just because you have lipolysis doesn't mean you – have lipid oxidation. And so you may understand that. You may also understand how to reduce stress. I talk about that a lot as well. Rest-based living, you know, sex and physical affection, massage, therapies, time with loved ones, time with pets, creative pursuits, lots and lots of walking, especially in green settings, spa therapies, all that kind of stuff to lower the stress hormones, cortisol. But what do we do about this bottom-up effect? What do we do to support our mitochondria, right? Well, one of the things we need to do is make sure we create a calorie deficit, right? Make sure we decrease the load of acetyl-CoA that's constantly impacting our mitochondria. But there are also some things that we can do to protect those mitochondria. One is to make sure we have plenty of glutathione around to soak up. Glutathione is sort of like this wet, cool sponge that soaks up sort of the hot, you know, sauce that uh, the mitochondria produce. And so you want a lot of glutathione around. One of the cheapest ways to get that, by the way, glutathione is not a well-known or not a well-absorbed compound. You can get it very cheaply through whey protein. Whey protein has a lot of different amino acids that it has been shown to raise glutathione levels. So whey protein is very, very good for this. Whey protein also raises serotonin and lowers cortisol. So whey protein is one that I love. Alpha lipoic acid, too, is another one that is both a water-soluble and fat-soluble antioxidant, and it helps to keep glutathione levels restored. And so when this hydrogen peroxide, which by the way, for those of us whose beards are going white, if you see someone has a lot of white in their beards, that probably means it's a lot of hydrogen peroxide they're producing. Uh, Glutathione can soak that up. Alpha lipoic acid makes glutathione hang around a little bit longer. There's another one that I love called acetyl-CoA. Now there's that molecule acetyl I'm sorry, acetylcarnitine, but there's that molecule acetyl again, just like from acetyl-CoA, right? Well, that acetyl group helps the carnitine get into the mitochondria membranes, and carnitine is required to get some of the precursors to get fat from one side of the mitochondria into the other side to be burned. So carnitine is a very useful molecule for helping the mitochondria find their fat-burning mojo again, so to speak. And then the final one that I love that has a lot of new research on it is a compound called NAD+. Plus. NAD+, plus is sort of used, you can kind of think about, it's sort of used as a bussing system in the mitochondria that will bus, help bus protons into an area of the mitochondria so that it can use that gradient to make energy and make ATP. And so these nutrients, if you're wondering about what can I do to really help my mitochondria function better if I'm sort of wondering whether I've got some of this damage that's going on that you're talking about from this bottom-up effect, those would be my choices. And so I know that metabolic flexibility is a huge topic. This is a long sort of discussion. I know I've been rambling like crazy. You might want to listen to this again and again. The reason I wanted to do this, and definitely check out that Testosterone Nation article um, as well that I wrote, and I'll probably publish it on my blog as well at jtita.com. But the reason I want to talk about this is because we are learning more and more and more about metabolic flexibility and how important it is to be able to pick and choose 
our energy sources and to be able to burn ketones effectively and to be able to burn alcohol when needed and to be able to switch back and forth between sugar and fat based on demand and to be able to use protein in our fuel reserves appropriately and flexibly. This is going to be something you're going to hear more and more about. Not only that, it speaks to the heart of what everyone's talking about right now. When do I use a keto diet? And when do I use intermittent fasting? Well, one thing you probably learned from this is that to keep the metabolism flexible means you want to exercise different pathways. That means you do not want to learn, lose the ability to burn sugar, and you don't want to lose the ability to burn fat. And when you create metabolic gridlock, when you're eating way too much of all the things all the time, you will lose the ability to typically to burn fat first. That's why everyone gets these fat storage depots so big. And sugar Second, and so one of the things that you want to do to begin to force the body to learn how to burn fat and sugar again is to spend time in one metabolic pathway or the other. And this is one of the reasons why most people are overeating sugar, not overeating fat. This is one of the reasons why you're hearing about, hey, switch your diet from a sugar-based approach, carbohydrate-based approach, to a fat-based approach, and you may reap some benefits. But hopefully, I've given you some of the caveats here. For those of you who are really, really obese, really, really metabolically inflexible, and have found that you just get very sick and cannot possibly do an intermittent fasting approach or a keto approach, you may need to do this small, frequent meals with a protein and fiber-based approach approach as a go-between, as a bridge before those other things will work. So I'm going to stop there. Um, I hope this was useful for you. Do me a favor and, you know, give me a shout out after you listen to this. You can find me over at at JT on Instagram. That's where I spend most of my time or at JT on Facebook or just send me a message at support at JTita.com. I'd love to hear what you think about metabolic flexibility and um, I can answer some of your questions there if you get in touch with me on Instagram. All right, guys, uh, good to be back and I will see you at the next episode.